This is lecture CC1. In this lecture, we're going to start by talking about homeostasis and equilibrium and how they are not the same thing. We'll talk about feedback, especially negative feedback, and how that works in homeostasis. We'll talk a little bit about the importance of water in biochemistry and why that's about why we're about to spend a lot of time on atoms and bonds. Then we'll talk about the structure of atoms, ions, and how ionic bonding works, the idea of covalent bonding and how that is related to the idea of polar and nonpolar bonds with the idea of electronegativity, and finally, how that goes into the idea of hydrophilic and lipophilic materials and how they interact with water. Hello, everybody. Welcome. This is lecture CC1, the first core concepts lecture. Uh, this is my garage uh, slash workshop slash classroom, I guess, while we're doing these odd recorded lectures in this strange time of the pandemic. So you'll see some odd things in here. Please ignore all the mess and just... Uh, Pay attention to what we're doing up here. So, today we're going to be going over some of the fundamental concepts of the class, kind of starting from a very, very big picture and theoretical ideas, and then working our way down into molecules and atoms and bonding, which is kind of where we're going to start our concept. So, let's get going. The first thing I wanted to go over is that if there was one concept which would really kind of encapsulate all of physiology, it would probably be the idea of homeostasis. Homeostasis is the body's tendency to keep certain aspects of your internal environment consistent. For example, uh, in the human body, we keep a consistent internal body temperature, generally around 37 degrees Celsius, maybe a little cooler than that. We keep our blood at a relatively constant pH of about 7.4. And we do this even though the environment outside, the environment we're exposed to, doesn't share those characteristics. So usually it's cooler than that. So because it's usually cooler outside than 37 Celsius, heat goes from our body to the outside world, which means we have to work to keep our body warmer. But we don't want to keep it too warm or we'll get too hot. So this concept of homeostasis is the idea of maintaining aspects of the body at a consistent level, even when things are trying to change them. And you could make an argument that most of what our body does is about maintaining homeostasis. Most of the mechanisms in our physiology are about keeping one aspect or another of our body consistent, maintaining this homeostasis. Now, one commonly confused concept that often gets mixed up with that is the idea of equilibrium. We hear the word equilibrium and we have very positive connotations with it. We think of it, yes, I want to maintain equilibrium. I feel at equilibrium. We think of it as balance and steadiness. And in a way, that's true. But in the scientific world, the word equilibrium has some fairly specific meanings. And it's important to know that homeostasis is not the same thing as equilibrium. If we're going to be more formal, one way to define equilibrium would be the idea that it's a state in which things are not changing. That's the first thing, that in equilibrium, some things are not changing. And no work, no energy is required to keep them that way. So, for example, if I have a beaker of water... and I put some red dye in it, and that red dye spreads out through the water equally, so the whole thing is kind of tinted red. I could say that in terms of like the concentration of that dye at various places in the beaker, we're at equilibrium. That the concentration of that dye at this location is not going to change very much. It may randomly fluctuate slightly, but overall it's going to stay pretty much the same. And I don't have to do anything to keep it that way. If I walk, if I seal that up and walk away and come back in a hundred years, that will still be the case. Assuming that that dye is nicely soluble in water, it will still be spread equally through that water. The concentration there won't have changed. That's equilibrium. That's a true equilibrium. That's not what your body is like in general. Very, very rarely is any part of your body actually in equilibrium. So for example, let's look at body temperature. 
My body right now is warmer than the air around me, although it's kind of hot today, but still, it's warmer than the air around me. So, am I at equilibrium with my environment? Absolutely not. Heat is moving from my body to the world around me. If you feel me, I am warm. I would show up on infrared. I'm radiating heat. So, I can't be at equilibrium with my environment because something is changing. Heat is moving from me to the environment. In order to keep my body warm, I have to do work. I have to put energy into maintaining that difference between me and the environment, into maintaining homeostasis, a consistent internal body temperature. That's just one example. Let's look at another kind of example of what we mean by equilibrium using a slightly different system. If we imagine, let's have the ground here, and let's put a plank of wood on the ground. Let me see if this brown marker has any usable ink in it. Yeah. So there's a plank of wood sitting on the ground. Now, that plank of wood is more or less at equilibrium. It's not going anywhere. It's not going to do anything on its own. It's not changing. It's in position. It's pretty much at equilibrium. But that also means that you can't, it won't, it, that means it can't do anything interesting. If you want that piece of wood to move or flip over or doing something, it's going to be relatively hard to do it. You're going to have to get in there and put in a lot of energy to flip that up or lift it or move it around. It's hard to get something that's in equilibrium out of equilibrium. That's the thing about equilibrium. It's an inherently stable state. Things tend to move, move toward equilibrium and then stay there. It's sort of like the low point, that if you're rolling downhill, you roll down into the bottom of the valley, and then you tend to stay there. To get out of that spot, you have to put work into it. In many ways, that's very much what equilibrium is like. And that's not what our body is like. My body does things. When, I, when my heart beats, it's doing stuff and moving blood around. When my muscles contract, it's relatively easy for me to get that to happen. Yes, it takes energy. If my nerves are gonna send a signal from one place to another, it's relatively easy to get it to do that. That's because most areas of my body are not in equilibrium. They may be maintaining homeostasis, but they're not at equilibrium. If I wanted to put this plank of wood in a non-equilibrium state, I might do something like this. Let's make a teeter-totter. I'm not sure what word is used for this anymore. The thing on the playground where there's a plank balance on a point and kids get on one side. I'm not even sure they use those anymore because, of course, they're terribly unsafe because people could get hurt. They're not terribly unsafe. They're fun. But anyway... If we balance this piece of wood, this plank, on a fulcrum, and I put two kids on this plank, is it possible to maintain that plank at level? More or less, yes. But it's difficult. You have to put work into it. You can maintain a steady state of level plank, but it requires work. You have to keep monitoring it and shifting weight back and forth. If you don't believe me, try this. Stand on one foot. Now, when I'm doing that, I can feel my I feel the muscles of my leg and hip moving, and I'm kind of bending around at my ankle a lot. Why? Because my body is trying to maintain this state, but I am definitely not at equilibrium. I'm having to put effort into maintaining that position constantly shifting my weight that takes energy to do. Likewise, we could keep that plank balanced, but only by the two kids carefully shifting their balance around and making, and making sure the plank stays steady. This is not in equilibrium. What it is, is in a steady state. And another term you might use here would be a uh, dynamic disequilibrium. Dynamic implies that it's changing, that there's stuff going on. And disequilibrium tells you this is, not, this is not in equilibrium, but it is in a steady state. We're just having to put in work to keep it that way. Now, another question you might then ask is, well, then what's the advantage of this? If I have to put in work to keep that plank level, I wouldn't have to put in work if I just put it on the ground. Why would I ever want this? The reason you might want that is 
What if I want one of those kids to get launched into the air? If I put a plank on the ground, and have two kids stand on it, one on each end, and I want one of those kids to get launched into the air, that's difficult. You're going to have to go in there and put in a lot of work and lift that plank really hard and really fast to throw that kid up in the air. That's difficult, because that plank is in equilibrium and it's hard to get it out of equilibrium. But think about this state, where we're in a managed dynamic disequilibrium. All I have to do to launch, to do something drastic here, is not take that kid off. Now that's not going to launch this kid in the air, he's going to hit the ground hard. But it still will do something. It will do something fairly dramatic. And it's easy to get it to do it. All I have to do is have this kid jump off. And then something big happens. That's because this is not an equilibrium. It's in a balanced state, but if you take, if you affect it, you can get something relatively big to happen. One analogy in the human body, and we're going to get to this in the next unit, is the idea of the action potential in a neuron. In a nerve cell, and don't worry if you don't understand the details here, we'll get to it though. The cell membrane is maintaining a steady voltage. It has to put in work to maintain that voltage, but it's doing it. However, all I have to do to cause something dramatic to happen is open a certain set of ion channels. And if I just open those channels, because of the way this is set up, that voltage changes suddenly and dramatically, which is how part of how nerve signals work. And it can do that only because it is not in equilibrium. It's maintained in a steady non-equilibrium state. So that's an important concept to get across when you're thinking of physiology. Homeostasis is keeping things at a steady, steady state. Equilibrium is also a steady state, but equilibrium is inherently stable. And in general, the body is not. It's maintained in a disequilibrium state, which allows us to do things with it by making small changes and throwing that equilibrium, off, that not equilibrium, steady state, off temporarily. That's how our body works. All right, now, so then the question is, if I want to maintain this plank, let's go back to this as our model system. If I want to maintain this plank level, steady state level, not equilibrium, how do I do it? Well, we looked at, or if I want to stay vertical while standing on one foot, how do I do it? Well, I can feel my muscles shifting around. How does my body know which way to shift them? When I stand on one foot, or when you're doing it, think about this. How does your body know how to move your muscles to keep you standing upright? Here's another one. Let's say I wanted to balance this pen on my, whoops, pan. that's not gonna work well. Okay, what if I wanted to balance this? Here, let's make this a little more interesting. Let's make several pens. Let's see if I could balance this. Oh, for a little while. For a few moments. Okay, now, that is not, that the position of that pen stack is not in equilibrium. It's changing, but I'm keeping it more or less level. How? How, and obviously I'm moving my hand around, but how do I know which way to move? Well, this is the idea. Now we're getting into uh, another big, big aspect of physiology here. The idea of feedback. How do I know which way to move my hand to keep the pen stack level, vertical? How do I know which muscles to move to keep my body from tipping over? How do these kids know how to move in order to keep the plank level? All of those they know because of feedback. You have a situation, you take in information about the situation, and that guides you to change something which will correct any, anything you see changing. When I've got the pen stack and I see it tilting one way, I know to move my hand outward. If it moves the other way, I know to move my hand back. I move it to counteract the tilt. If this plank starts to tip this way, the kids know to move that way to shift their balance to restore that. In other words, they're getting feedback. As the, the system you're looking at changes, you observe that change and you do something to counteract that change. You're using feedback. Get information, change the system. 
then the system changes, get information about the change, change the system. Now, there's actually more than one kind of feedback. What we're talking about here when we're trying to maintain some sort of homeostasis is specifically negative feedback. So we need to talk a little bit about that in detail. So what I'm going to do here is erase the board, bam, and let's get into the details here. So negative feedback. In a negative feedback system, the concept, the overall idea, is that you observe something about the environment, you compare what you're observing to what you think it should be, and then you do something to try to fix it if it's not where it should be. So, just at a conceptual level, let's think about that in holding up our pen stack. So. I'm looking at this, so I'm getting information through my eyes about whether this is vertical. Now let's say I see it start to go to the left. Now, I am now bringing in information. I'm, what I'm measuring is tilt of the pen stack. I want tilt to be zero, but here I'm seeing tilt which is not zero. So something is wrong, and I, I compare this is not the right tilt, it's off in one particular direction, so what do I need to do? Move my hand to correct it. So now it tilts the other way. Oh, it's now it's not where it should be again. So I move my hand back to correct it. Oh, not where it should be. I bring in information, so I observe the system, compare to what it should be, so it, to its desire state and then make changes to bring it closer to the desired state. That's the basic idea of negative feedback. You take a measurement, you compare that measurement to what it should be, and if it's not what it should be, you do something to make it closer to what it should be. Is the tilt zero? No? Okay, then do something to make it closer to zero. That kind of system tends to keep the thing you're measuring close to where it should be. It's called negative feedback because you observe something, you measure how far off it is from where it should be, and then you try to make that difference smaller. That's the idea of negative feedback. You're trying to reduce the difference between what you look at and where it should be. There are some terms that we use for that. We talk about, in a negative feedback system, one way of looking at it is to use these terms. We have a sensor, which measures something, a set point, which is the desired state of what we measure. An integrator, which compares sensor to set point. And effectors which can change the thing we measure. So those are four things that you will find in a negative feedback system. Sometimes it's hard to say exactly what they are in the system, and sometimes they're sort of combined, but conceptually, those are things you might find. So you'll have something which measures something about what you're looking at, something which says this is what that should be, something which says are they the same, and if not, it can control effectors which will make it closer to what it should be. Now, the classical system that sometimes people use to describe this is the idea of a thermostat. So in a thermostat, if I've got an air conditioner, I've got a sensor, a thermometer, and I've got a set point. I tell my, my thermostat, 
Okay, what should the temperature be? And then my thermostat can control heaters and air conditioners, which are effectors, to control that temperature. So the idea being, say, let's say I'm, I've got a thermostat in my house and I say, I want the temperature in my house to be 72 degrees. Now my thermostat looks at the, at the thermometer sensor and says, it's 74 degrees right now. It com my integrator, the thermostat, compares 74, what the sensor says, to 72, what I set the set point as, and says, it's too hot in here. And so what it does is use the air conditioner, the effector, to make the difference smaller, to bring the temperature down closer to the set point. So temperature drops, 74, 73, 72. Then I turn off the air conditioner, but it keeps dropping a little, 71, 70. Now, my thermostat compares the sensor, 70, to the set point, 72, and says, oh, it's too low. I need to use a different effector, so it turns on the heater and brings the temperature up. And it might go back and forth here a little, and of course it's probably not exactly going to use a heater in that case, but you get the idea. It's trying to keep the temperature close to the set point. Easy, but this is physiology, so let's talk about the human body. Let's talk about an ex how this works in our body. So I'll draw up a negative feedback diagram. You'll see these once or twice in the course. This is just one way of kind of putting this together. So this is going to be our integrator. And here is our sensor. And that integrator will control effectors. And these, in turn, can control the thing I'm measuring. Here in the integrator, we will also have a set point. So this is just a drawing kind of showing what we were just talking about. Let's put, let's put this in the context of how the human body deals with body temperature. So we're looking at body temperature. That's the thing I'm measuring. The sensor and integrator for body temperature is probably the hypothalamus, which is a part of the brain we'll talk about later. So probably this is the hypothalamus. And our set point would normally be 37 degrees Celsius. Now let's say my sensor I'm, when I'm measuring this, it says it, I am currently at 39 degrees Celsius. So when my hypothalamus measures body temperature, it sees 39. It says, oh, should be 37. How exactly that works at a cellular molecular level, honestly, I don't know for sure. But we don't need to worry about it right now. But what's it going to do? If my body temperature is too high, what effector can I use to lower my body temperature? Well, there are several. I can use sweating and vasodilation, meaning dilating blood vessels in this, specifically in the skin in this case. So this is vasodilation in the skin to allow more warm blood to the surface of the body where it can radiate heat out to the world. So if I do those things, it will lower my body temperature. I'll put that here as a minus. So this will decrease body temperature. That should bring this number down closer to the set point. So let's say that works and we bring it down to 37. Then we say, okay, great. We're at normal body temperature. Um, everything is good. You can stop the sweating and the vasodilation. And then it gets colder outside. And this drops down to 36. Now my temperature is too low. Well, I don't want to do this. That would just bring it down more. Instead, I'm going to use a different effector. Shivering and vasoconstriction in the skin. That will raise my body temperature. Now we've got a negative feedback system. We have a system where 
If my temperature is too high, I use sweating and vasodilation to bring it down. If it's too low, I use shivering and vasoconstriction to bring my temperature up. And thus we keep our body temperature at a consistent level. Nice! Throughout this course, you will see multiple negative feedback systems. Um, I'll try to point them out when I see them. We'll even occasionally draw them up with this kind of diagram. Like when we get to the endocrine system, there's several in there. The kidneys use, se use several. They're all over the place. Because this is a good way to maintain homeostasis. It kind of makes sense. All right. Now, let's take a look at something interesting about this. This makes sense. But now I want you to think about the last time you had a fever. What's a fever? A fever is when your body temperature is higher than normal. So last time I got sick and got a fever, I took my temperature and I said, oh, it's, much, it's higher than it should be. My temperature is 39 degrees Celsius. Ah, I, I have a fever. And looking at this system, what should my body be doing when I have a fever? If my body temperature is too high, I should be sweating and vasodilating. I should be seeking out ways to get rid of body heat. But is that what you do when you have a fever? It's not what I do. I found myself shivering and trying to get under the covers and turning on the heater in my car if I was driving. I was doing all the things that I would normally do if my body temperature was too low, which doesn't make sense, does it? Have I broken my negative feedback system? Is that what happens with a fever? Do you break your thermostat? No, because this set point can also be changed. When I have a fever, there are chemical messengers called pyrogens, which affect my brain and cause it to change the set point. So in a fever, the set point is going to go up. Now, think about this. Let's say my body is at normal temperature, 37 degrees Celsius, and then I get sick. And my body turns up my set point. Turns up, says 39 is where it should be. Now, let's look at what our negative feedback system is going. My body temperature is perfectly normal, but my set point is 39, so my body says, you're too cold. You're below the set point. And what do you do when you're too cold? You shiver. You constrict. You get under the covers. You turn on the heater. You feel cold and you want to warm up. All the things that happen when, you sh when you've got a fever. In a fever, your negative feedback system is working perfectly normally. It's just you've turned up the thermostat. You've turned up the set point. So your body is now trying to maintain a higher body temperature than it normally would. So, you shiver, you feel bleh, you get under the covers, and you bring your body temperature up to 39. And now you, somebody takes your temperature and says, oh, you've got a fever, your body temperature is high. So, you're sick for a while, and then you get better. And one morning, you wake up, and your sheets are soaked with sweat. Why are they soaked with sweat? Because, during the night, your fever broke. What that means is, your body got over enough of the illness to turn your set point back down. And now that your set point is down at 37, your body says, okay, we should be at 37. What's our current temperature? 39? Holy crud, it's too hot. Too high? Sweat. Ah! And your sheets get soaked because now your body is saying, okay, we don't need to be this hot anymore. Cool down, cool down. That's what happens when your fever breaks. It's still negative feedback. It's just, in a case of a fever, you're changing your set point, which causes your negative feedback system to try to maintain a different body temperature. That kind of makes it all make sense. All right. You'll see many more examples of negative feedback as we go. Before I end this first part of this first lecture, I want to talk about the idea of positive feedback. Actually, let's keep this. So let's, Im what would happen if we switched these around and said, when my body temperature was too 
low, I did this. My, my body temperature was too high, I did this. Let's see what would happen. My set point is 37. Let's say we're just a little bit too hot, 38. My body says, oh, temperature is too high. What do I do? Well, in this case, I start shivering and constricting blood vessels, which generates more heat. So that raises my temperature. Oh, okay, so now it's 39. My body says, oh, I'm too hot. What do I do? I shiver. And it raises it more. Notice what's happening here. If I flip those two around, what I've done is set up a system where when I get off of the set point, when I'm too hot, I do stuff that makes me even hotter. I get further away from the set point. Or, if I'm too cold, 36, my body says, oh, temperature's too low. Time to sweat and radiate heat, which cools me off more, so I get even lower. Which says, oh, you're too low, do more. It's moving me away from my set point. When I'm cold, it makes me colder. If I'm hot, it makes me hotter. That doesn't work for maintaining body temperature. It's exactly the opposite of what we want. What we've built here is what we call a positive feedback system. Positive feedback meaning when we, get, when we see a difference from the set point, we do something to make that difference bigger, positively affected, rather than negative where we try to make it smaller, get closer to the set point. Positive feedback systems are inherently unstable. That A positive feedback system when I'm trying to hold my pen stack up would be to say, when it tilts away, do something which makes that tilt more. So let's see how all that works. So it tilts away. I did not keep my pen stack level. So, Positive feedback systems are inherently unstable. They tend to make things get worse fast. Not necessarily worse, wrong term to use. But because they are kind of anti-homeostatic, they are relatively rare in the body. There's a few examples. The most common one that people talk about is uh, a process that happens during childbirth, where the pressure of the baby's head on the cervix, which is trying to be stretched out over the head to allow the baby to come out, pressure of the head on the cervix causes the secretion of the hormone oxytocin, which increases the strength of uterine contractions, which presses the baby's head harder on the cervix, which causes you to secrete more oxytocin, which presses the baby harder, and so on. That's useful during childbirth because you've got to stretch that cervix out a lot to get that baby out. But it is inherently unstable, which means after the process of childbirth, we have to turn that system off. You have to go away from being a positive feedback system, which we do. Well, actually, yeah, never mind. Um, we'll see another one at the very first part of the nerve signal, where a small change in membrane potential causes something to happen which makes a bigger change in membrane potential. But they are relatively rare, and almost always they only happen for short periods of time. So what you've learned about in this first section is the idea that homeostasis, that homeostasis and equilibrium are not the same thing. In fact, our body is almost never in equilibrium. One way to think about that is, when is my body really at equilibrium? When I'm dead. That's the time when my everything comes to rest with the environment around me. Anyway, so, and you've learned about the idea of negative feedback systems and how they help maintain homeostasis and the rarer positive feedback systems which actually accelerate away from steady state. Let's go on to our next part in the second part of this lecture.